Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm very glad to welcome you to this workshop, a very important workshop for DHP. And first of all, I would like to thank you, the University Hospital uh, of Leuven, for hosting us and uh, to give us the opportunity to see how it works to our in reality, because I think this is important. Uh, for people not uh, uh, not every day in the hospital to see how it, how it works. But second, uh, I would like to uh, thank the promoter of this uh, workshop, which is Richard Price. On the please, <laughs> he was uh, organizing together with our staff. And please, uh, an applause for our staff. I must say. We had a fantastic staff organizing this very professionally, and uh, it's the first time in my life I see all our staff together, because uh, I see one and all uh, two events, and today we have all our staff with us, so you see eight person of our staff. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of you to come to us, uh, because it's very important to bring together industry, with hospital pharmacies, authorities, and we have uh, some representatives from patients group and doctors, because this is, uh, uh, the scope is to uh, have a better patient safety. As you know, uh, 40, around 40% 40 of medication errors happens at the bedside, at, at administration. And we know that barcoding technology can reduce this by 40%. This is something very important for patient safety. Patient safety is in focus of our association. So that is why we bring you together to look what can technology do to improve patient safety. Technology is one part. I think never one of you would like to sit in an airplane where the uh, pilots have a very high technology and no education. I think it's important to have education, but technology is very important for all hospital pharmacists to, uh, and nurses and doctors to improve patient safety because technology is supporting us. I will not make a, a, a big uh, speech. I, I hope that we will have a very interesting workshop. Enjoy the workshop. And then, uh, now I'm going over to start the workshop with the, with the content. Thank you very much. I'm also glad to welcome you in the name of the hospital. Uh, I will give a warm welcome to the European Association, to the GS1 organization, and to all the participants uh, who made this trip today uh, due to the rainy weather. Uh, we have an agenda. And we skip already the first things, welcome coffee and a welcome word. So we move on to the uh, part about barcode scanning and all the things you came for. Uh, some practical information before we start is that there's Wi-Fi available for uh, those who cannot get out their smartphones or computers. Um, I thought I had to use a password, but it's in your bundle on, uh, in your places and it's also written on the whiteboard on the right. Uh, after this presentation we go to the wards and we go in seven groups and in your uh, bundles on the table there are uh, your group numbers. Uh, so when we start you will uh, start with the people who bring you to the wards one to seven. And for the workshops uh, we use a similar scenario where we use the letters A to D. Uh, don't worry, all the workshops have identical topics. If you want to review everything, presentations will be available also with a webcast on the EHP uh, website. So, for the first presentation, barcode scanning, the missing link in patient safety. Uh, I'm Thomas de Rijt, as presented, I'm the president of the Belgian Association of Hospital Pharmacists, board member of the Flemings Association, and assistant director of the pharmacy department of this hospital. And I'm not talking about barcoding, I want to talk to you about patient safety. So, before we start, I want to know, all of you, who is afraid to go to the hospital? Okay, I see probably one-third of the people raising their head. That means that two-thirds of you are sleeping, I think. So, those who are afraid, and I am afraid as well. Why are you afraid to go to the hospital? 
For me, it's because when I, I screw up, my boss is very angry. Maybe you can, uh, can stand your doctor, or you just don't like the food in the hospital. But let me tell you, you're wrong. Anything can go wrong in the hospital. We don't make mistakes in hospitals until 1999. So what happened in 1990? Did we start making mistakes? No. And I won't sign to a human because it's like throwing a birthday party for a 15-year-old baby, for a 14-year-old baby. But this was the first time that we knew that we were making mistakes and what, uh, in what it resulted. And when I make an extrapolation to Belgium, then we see that we have more than 150 deaths due to medication errors per year. And it is an amount of money for a 700-bed hospital for about 2.5 million euros. When you're talking about patient safety and outcome, we can also uh, represent it in uh, avoidable adverse drug events in 2% of the admissions. So, hospitals, if not uh, lead it very well, can be hazardous to your health. <coughs> and when we take a look from where these uh, errors come, then we see that the source of errors in 56% is uh, find its origin in prescribing, 6% in transcribing, and 34% <coughs> in administration, bedside, to a patient. And I like this slide as a pharmacist. We have this 4% is due to uh, problems in the pharmacy process. So, if you want to reduce medication errors, then the first thing you should focus on is to the prescribing part. And when we take uh, care of that, and we implement a CPOA system, we can have an impact on 62% of the origin of uh, medication errors. With a CPOA in place, we can focus on the bedside administration of medication, and then we can focus on 34% of medication errors. And then, there's the angle for the pharmacist. If you don't do anything, your slice of 4% will grow because the others will be diminishing. So we also have to control the pharmacy process as well. So in this hospital, we like quality a lot. We were the first to achieve the accreditation by the Joint Commission International in Belgium. Uh, and we also are ISO 9001 certified, so we thought we should do something about patient safety. And the first thing we do was, uh, we went from prescribing, as you see here, and we went to the CPOA system, uh, which you see the outcome here. At least, what you see is readable, but I agree with you, physicians, nurses, they have to learn a lot of color codes. With the CPOE, you don't do, anything. You don't do uh, all the things. Uh, what we implemented afterwards was a decision support for prescribers. So, we entered the formulary uh, data into the system and we suggest a physician to, the switch, to do a formulary switch. We also control real-time and online for allergies, drug allergies, which we show in a ribbon bar as uh, shown below. Uh, we do so a drug-drug interaction check, that's the three, it is the GM, GM uh, part, where we have three levels of uh, uh, interactions, where you see, and it's due to the screen, it looks yellow, but it's, it's green, orange, red, uh, where we have the five, that's five minor, three possible, and uh, zero uh, high priority interactions. We also check for double medication, and it wouldn't be the first patient with uh, five benzodiazepines on its therapy sheet. For the ladies, we do a check on contraindications for uh, pregnancy with safe, not safe, and unknown. We do a check for drug-food interactions, and we also have a visual uh, for pain score for the physicians to adapt the pain protocol as a fifth vital sign with the patient. So with a perfectly CPOA in place and physicians uh, prescribing very well, we come to the patient and you know when you come to a hospital, you're never a number. Unless Although, when I take a look at administration of medication, I only see numbers. I don't know what's in the syringe. I don't know what's in this uh, plate uh, upstairs. So, that's what we had years and years ago, and I think that in some places this is still uh, common practice. Then you say, oh, no, we do it better. We put everything in a little jar and we write room and bed on it. And I'm the patient in room 451, bed 3 but I just upgraded to a double room or a single room, and you are the one now editing uh, room 451, bed 3. And you don't know which medication I'm taking, but it will be yours in a few minutes, because that's what you're given if you just identify uh, on bed and on room number. So, when we want to prevent that, then we had uh, saying that we can uh, uh, enter a lot of controls in this uh, process, but in the end, 
you only can do one check, the final checkpoint is the patient, and that's bedside scanning. So, when we wanted to implement that in our hospital, we thought, what do we need? And the requirements to implement bedside scanning are a fully deployed CPOE system. Of course, hardware and software to scan barcodes to check uh, whether it's the right drug for the right patient at the right time. Of course, identify patients, and you see all patients will wear bracelets uh, as a double identifier in the hospital. And last but not least, and that's why we're here today, is a barcode on any, every single dose from the primary package. And when we translate this to our hospital, and we're talking about 14 million doses a year. And if, excuse me, if you get a deadline to start with that, so it's bedside scanning, then it's a hell of a job to get 40 million doses a year ready to be barcode scanned. So we took a look at the market. And forgive me, this is just a sample. If you see a brand or a, a company, it's just an example of what you all do. Uh, we see that medication, uh, a rather expensive medication, can be uh, bought in capsules in jars. There's bulk uh, in medication, no identification to the single uh, tablet or uh, capsule, <coughs> no expiry date, no batch number, no barcode. But you can also have, on the other end, uh, single dose barcoded medications. And when you see the price, it mustn't be that uh, expensive. But in between, there's a lot of packages, what we call multi-dose blistering, and where we see that there's uh, very, very uh, poor uh, drug identification uh, on the side of the blister. We see a lot of uh, branding, we see a lot of uh, big names, but we don't see batch numbers, we don't see expiry dates, we don't see product identification. So this is the thing we don't need, we don't want, because we cannot use it for patient safety in barcode scanning. Let me tell you about single dose barcoded versus unidose packaging. When we started this process or this project, we were all talking about unidose. And then we see that it was uh, semantics that brought us to a single dose. Single dose is defined as the physic, uh, physically uh, physically one piece, one ampule, one tablet, and one package. While on the other hand, on the right side of the screen, we see, it's, uh, it's candy, you see uh, multiple drugs in, in little bags, and then you see that there's a, a unidose, this is given in one dose for the patient. And there can be a mix of similar products, for instance, two aspirins, 500 milligrams, or it can be multiple drugs when you see the, the white, green, orange one. So, which do we prefer? Of course, the left one, because we think bulk, medica bulk medication uh, is not done. Because I compare it always to these little nuts you get when you go to a cafe uh, with your pint of beer. And if you know where these nuts come from and who has uh, handled them, and you know where they come from with a little brown door in the back, then you know what I prefer a single dose packed speculoos. <laughs> So, 40 million doses, how do you get them ready? Because they're hard to get, as I told you. So, we start repacking in our pharmacy. It's legally seen as compounding, so hospital pharmacists can do it. We needed a GMP uh, process in the clean room, and uh, we bought four blistering machines, and we found out that it's very, very, very time consuming. So, we looked around, and we found some partners to do outsourcing the repacking process. It's legally possible in Belgium. We also have partners with the GMP process in the clean room, and what we have learned is that it's very expensive for small batches, so we ended up with a mix of both repacking in the pharmacy and outsourcing with our partners to get those 14 million doses ready. But with a little help, I think we can do it better. A little help from the pharmaceutical industry. When they deliver, or when you deliver, single dose barcoded packages, then it's is uh, a lot easier to get those 14 million doses ready. Uh, it gives a better uh, forecasting for us and for you. And when we talked to the delegates of the companies, then we saw a lot, a lot of willingness, but also a lot of buts. And the most common, uh, I've written down, so this is global management doesn't see the advantage of it. Or blister lines are European or global, and you request a uh, Belgian packaging with a barcode. Or, oh, it's a different registration, it's a different artwork, it's a lot of work and a lot of administrative burden. Or, there's a need for a standard, or we need a legal obligation to convince uh, our company to do so. 
And last but not least, uh, we're also always talking about cost and difference between the different European markets or global markets. So I think we don't need only a little help for the pharmaceutical industry, we need also uh, a little help or maybe a lot of help from policy makers. Please, that's my, uh, my request, provide us with a standard and a flexible framework for registration, for changing the artwork and for the information on the primary package so that there is a standard and it's clear for everybody what to do and uh, when they can start uh, working on uh, changing the process. Therefore, in 2007, there was the first request from the European Association to produce single-dose packed drugs, and this was underscribed by the Belgian Association from Hospital Pharmacists who had a request for single-dose uh, barcoded medication as well. And I say that in 2011, this request is updated uh, by the European Association of Hospital Pharmacists, and even pointing to a standard uh, non commercial one, the GS1, uh, with their GTIN code, Global Trade Identifying Number, uh, which can be used to make a translation uh, and link to our own databases. So, I get the question why should a company do single dose barcoding? <coughs> And I have a few answers on my own, but I think this afternoon in the workshops you can formulate your own ones, and maybe they're uh, in line, or maybe they're just the opposite of what I'm thinking. But I think there is a GMP production facility available in, in the company. We get optimal storage conditions because uh, we don't have to open the primary package. Even if we don't do bulk medication, we uh, repack in the best uh, foils we have in the clean room environment, then we have to breach the primary package. There's minimal cost. And yes, it will cost, but it's minimal because you just do it only once. And what we have learned is that the bigger the batch, the lower the cost per unit. There's the aspect of liability. Uh, then we know for sure uh, who's liable when something happens. Right now we have a, a bit of vacuum or gray zone uh, because uh, we are breaching the, the primary, uh, primary packaging. There's a protection against counterfeiting and it brings us to the obligation to use the barcode on the secondary packages, which we saw in the news a few weeks ago. Of course, uh, GS1 standard uh, is also uh, available, it's also possible to do supply chain management on all packaging levels. And last but not least, I think with tendering uh, coming up in Belgium and in Europe, uh, I think there's an added value in drug selection uh, for P&T committees for doing track and trace as be obliged by law uh, in the few years in Belgium. So that's why I think that companies should do a uh, single dose barcode medication. But I think also that you do it, that we should do it step by step. And you ask me, uh, how can we achieve this, uh, these, three, these three things, identification, uh, batch number and expiration date. I think we can only do this one step for identification, and I make it very, very easy. You go to a printing service, you order an order ribbon. I know it's not that easy, but it's more easy than doing inline printing for step two, where you have a uh, different uh, number for each batch uh, of medication, because you have to print a serial number, a batch number, or an expiration date. So, with this step one identification, we get a unique identifier, which we can use in our translation tables. For all our products, we have a one-to-end relation. When we scan a barcode, we can bring it back to the product in our database with our article numbers. And that's why it should be unique, because if uh, two medicines are carrying the same uh, barcode number, then we get a mix-up in the database. But I think also, uh, on the other end, it can be interesting. When we're talking about leaflets, we have a lot of problems. When you get them out of the package, you cannot get them, get them in again. So patient leaflets, photos of, of products, because it's also interesting for a nurse to see, oh, it's, it's the, the round white or the, the, the round yellow pill. So we can also give um, uh, information on medication in databases and link to it with this unique uh, global or European uh, number. I see also advantages for primary care. That's also a thing uh, I'm asked. What, what do you see uh, for advantages out of the hospital? In, in, a, in a time where everyone is having smartphones, where everyone is doing barcode scanning, QR scanning, maybe it's possible in, in X years that patients can do a control of their, um, uh, their medication by just scanning the barcode when they're taking it. Uh, because patient compliance for medication is still something we have to work on. So maybe this uh, barcode can also help in a primary care. 
But you didn't come uh, to hear me requesting uh, to produce barcodes of sing uh, single dose pack medication. You did come to see barcode scanning in practice. And I won't uh, be talking too much about these screenshots uh, because this is what you're going to see in, in real life when you go to, up to the wards in a few minutes. Uh, but the nurse is having a screen in our, uh, in our uh, his system, hospital information system, where we have three uh, statuses. We have the status of dispensing and ordering medication. We have the status of reconstitution of medication. And finally, we have the administration of medication. And just a few screenshots from each of them. They can order medication according to the prescription. And the system will help them whether this medication can be taken from the ward stock, whether it should be bought in a pharmacy, or whether they should uh, compound it or better reconstitute it. But this way of handling medication has also advantages for the pharmacy. When in the pharmacy we get structured data, we can do a lot of uh, things with it. This is one of the lists we working list for uh, dispensing medication in the pharmacy. We have done a risk stratification in which we have uh, made colored lines for our uh, risk products. We have also a lot of uh, risk codes. And then we can choose which uh, lines we have to check in detail for which patient we have to open patient files to see whether this is the right therapy for the right patient just before delivering it uh, to the patient. After the medication comes up to the ward, it can be possible that uh, nurses have to do a reconstitution of medication. For instance, amoxiclavulanic acid in an infusion. Uh, doctors are used to, do, to prescribe amoxiclavulanic acid one gram, four times a day, and that's it. And then I'm always asking, what do I have to make it in my hands or in an infusion bag? So, we want to know whether a nurse do, is doing the reconstitution well, and because it's not done bedside, but in a central area in your ward, we want to do barcode scanning over there as well as uh, we do for bedside. So, uh, maybe a bit unrespectful, but every time the medication changes from container, we do a scan check. For the case in which we have to do reconstitution, I check my, I scan myself, I scan uh, the product label, and then I scan all the ingredients, amoxiclavulanic acid, one vial of one gram, I scan uh, the water for injection to dissolve it, and I scan the infusion bag, and then I produce a new label, this is for a test patient, which goes onto the uh, prepared infusion, and then the computer knows this infusion bag is prepared according to the prescription for that patient, and it's done by Thomas de Red, and he has used this and this and this ingredient for it. And when my colleague in another shift uh, will be administering this medication, computer knows where it will be expired, where it's the right drug, the right time, and the right dose uh, for this patient. Just a brief uh, peek to a, a few screens. We have to uh, put some intelligence in the bedside scanning system, because sometimes you're using half a tablet, and you're scanning a, a whole one, then the computer must alert you, on the other hand, sometimes you need two tablets, computer must alert you as well. So we have uh, built in a system with green, orange and uh, red lights where to say it's okay, you should pay attention, change something or don't administer it to a patient. Uh, but you will see these things uh, in real life during the war tours. So, if you ask me how does it work, very, very quickly, well, you scan a patient, you scan a drug, Real-time, online, this is checked through our translation table. In this case, I've uh, taken the example from an Alprazolam 0.5 milligrams, where we use the GS1 cheating code, and we are just translating into our own uh, article number, where we can check it into the CPOA system, whether this is the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And if this check is done, we get a red, green, or orange light, and then, after a green light, nurses can do the administration of the drugs. Very important question. Does it work? Why do you do all the effort? Does it, is there a benefit for a patient? And I can fully say, yes, it works. And not because we invented it or we implemented it in this hospital. No, because we, we do a follow-up. And since we implemented it, we found a lot of preventive errors. We prevented the wrong patient. We prevented the wrong product. The substitution uh, from formerly product uh, to another, we prevented uh, administration of the wrong product. 
wrong dose. Uh, for instance, uh, when you take a, 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 a warfarin uh, tablet from 3 milligrams, and the patient needs 1.5 milligram, and nurses are used to taking tablets, it wouldn't be the first time that it's not given a half a tablet 1.5 milligrams, but given 1.5 tablets being 4.5 milligrams. So, we also detected wrong doses. Wrong time of administration, you can find as many of them as you want, it just depends on what your definition of what's too late, because you cannot administer three products per patient for 28 patients on a ward, eight o'clock sharp. It's not possible. You have to define a time frame in which we say this is timely administered medication. But almost, what more important is the timeline. And we also prevented uh, one possible error with cytotoxics, where the patient uh, was uh, having his infusion bag of uh, uh, cytotoxic agent, where the computer detected that the hydration the lot of fluid to prevent the kidneys from the patient wasn't done yet. So a computer alerted the nurse, think this is the right product for the right patient. That's not the right sequence. You should first do the rehydration for the patient to protect the kidneys of the patient. We also detected double medication. Uh, it wouldn't be the first patient with five benzos on the therapy. The double dose is detected. And also a lot of contraindications and allergies for standing orders were detected by the system because we not run this whole check system only at the time of prescribing but also at the time of administration. For instance, for a standing order, a nurse is uh, administering medication, barcode check, and the system does all the checks for contraindications, double drug, and all the things I've told you. These are uh, these are events we prevented, but we also do uh, a follow-up on our uh, PIM incident reports. It's uh, FONA, Falls on Your Accidents uh, reporting. And we see that we get different types of incidents since we did barcode scanning. And that's uh, something we expected because when you change a system, you prevent errors. You see new types of errors popping up. Uh, but this is uh, a sign that what we did is having an impact. We also follow up on the use of the decision support by the physician whether they are accepting uh, our suggestion, whether they are clawing back, or whether they are overruling it. And we have also seen that we have uh, made a switch to uh, very good use of decision support by all the physicians. But I don't have to convince you, I think you have to see for yourself uh, whether it's useful or not. But I want to conclude my presentation with a little dream of mine, is when you're having steak in a restaurant, you know from which kitchen it's coming, and you even know from which cow it's coming. And I hope that one day we can do the same for every medication that we know, that this patient is getting a drug prepared in that pharmacy by that technician, and that they are used that raw materials to produce it. So, I think we have ended on time with uh, just one minute time for a question, if there are any. Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, in your process, you have the, uh, the, the system works, and you say that. Uh, in your process, you uh, scan the product. You scan, first you scan the patient, then you scan the product. But do you, do you scan the operator, the nurse? We, we don't scan the operator. Uh, we use the login from the operator. Our system is based on a, a user login. And when they walk away from their station, it's going in, in screen saving. When they're starting up another uh, session on another uh, computer, the first one is shutting down. So we know which operator is using the hospital information system. So we have this identification. So we have operator, we have patient, and we have products. There's a question over there. Yes, thank you very much. Um, in your slide, does it work? You said yes, it does. And you gave an example. I wonder if you'd actually qualified it in terms of before and after. I don't think it's possible to quantify because before you didn't know about the, the errors. It's, it's a bit uh, the, the error is human uh, article. Before 1999, you didn't make mistakes. Uh, we're aware of mistakes uh, since we're doing, uh, since we changed our culture in the hospital to a reporting culture. And we see that we have, um, we have other errors when we implemented that science scanning. But I don't have a quantification to, to, for instance, five years ago. Other questions? Okay, then we have to do a lot of 
logistical operations right now. We have to get you all to different wars. 